Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Editor-in-Chief, Bleacher Report, Ben Osborne. Thank you all for being here. Um, this is an absolute honor. I'm told that having sports as a part of CGI is a rare occurrence, so... Uh, thank you to everyone who helped make this happen. Um, I'm also honored to be representing Bleacher Report. I'm only about two months in as editor-in-chief of this uh, amazing website, social brand that uh, really connects with sports fans um, across all ages, races, etc. cetera. Um, I personally grew up playing sports, uh, decided when I was about 13 or 14 that I wasn't probably gonna make it as a baseball, basketball, or football player, but I liked reading and writing and pretty much dedicated myself to covering sports as a journalist at a, at a very young age. And I've carried that with me, you know, basically my whole life. I worked at Slam Magazine for almost 20 years, which is effectively a teen magazine for kids who are absolutely obsessed with the sport of basketball. Bleacher Report gives me the chance to cover all sports and you know, without a doubt, uh, I've learned lessons about friendship and teamwork, and those have carried me through personal relationships, professional relationships. Um, today's extra special because I'm joined with people who have done a whole lot more than me with their athletic abilities and interest in sports, um, from Olympics to business to the National Basketball Association. Um, so it's a it's a really nice opportunity and. You know, hopefully I, I can help facilitate some conversations, but I think the stars will be the star athletes that are joining us. So I'd like to take a minute to introduce them. Uh, we're going to do three panelists to begin with, uh, with a focus on Olympic athletes and their perspective. Then we can ask some questions, and then we'll have a second panel um, with, uh, with some more of an angle of professional sports. So, I would like to introduce our first uh, three panelists. This is for the Everyone Can Play Sports as a Catalyst for Development and Integration panel. Um, first up is Fencer from Team USA. Um, she is an amazing athlete. I know I saw her on the Colbert show, which was pretty neat. Um, so hopefully you recognize her, and if not, you're about to learn a lot more about her. Please welcome Ibtahaj Mohammed, fencer from Team USA. Uh, secondly, um, just back from Rio for the Paralympics, um, super successful swimmer, Becca Myers. <laughs> and our last uh, panelist for this first panel, um, also back, just back from Rio, four-time Team USA Paralympian medalist, Lex Gillette. Thank you. 
like I said, these are people that have done a lot more with sports than I have, and it's really an honor to share the stage with them. Um, I'd like to start with Ibtahaj. Um, you had really a, an amazing 2016 so far. Time Magazine named you one of the 100 most influential people. Uh, you've served as a sports ambassador for U.S. Department of State's Empowering Women and Girls Through Sports Initiative. And most recently, you just won the bronze medal in fencing at the Olympics in Rio. Congratulations. Thank you very much. You also became the first Muslim woman to wear a hijab while representing the United States in the Olympic Games, which has inspired young Muslim girls and women across the country. Can you tell us what it means to you to compete while wearing the hijab and how you've helped break barriers of stereotypes and discrimination against race and religion? Yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you everyone for coming out and uh, I guess supporting uh, us in our um, I'm just really excited to be here, obviously. Uh, but anyway, so uh, my journey in sport, I always say, um, has been super interesting because so many kids across the United States are afforded this wonderful opportunity to participate in sport. And as a, um, as a Muslim youth, as an African-American youth, um, sport was always really important in our household. Our parents encouraged us from a really uh, young age um, to be involved in sport, and, and our family weren't really given the choice of whether or not we would participate in sport. It was like you had to play. Um, our parents just kind of uh, let us pick whatever we wanted. I remember like, you know, opening our, our town recreation book and like, you know, finding different sports and trying them all out. And for me, as a Muslim female youth and a, being a, 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 um, observing the hijab, I, my parents were looking for a sport for me to play where I could be fully covered. So even though I like ran track, I played volleyball, and I played all these different sports, um, my mom always had to alter the uniform for me. And when I discovered fencing, I was like 12 going on 13 when I entered high school, it was just this really unique opportunity for me to be involved in a sport where I didn't have to um, look different from my teammates. And I realize now as an adult, you know, this, uh, it, it created this really unique experience for me where um, I felt like this sense of uniformity with my team and I felt a part of the team for the first time in my life at 13 years old, even though I had played sports for such a long time at that point. And um, if anyone knows anything about fencing historically, it's a, you know, a very white uh, dominated sport. It you know, historically um, was reserved for people who had a lot of money, like a you know, way back when, you had knights and people of nobility who participated in fencing. And when I started fencing, you know, in like early 2000, it still kind of remained um, a sport where a lot of the white kids in my school played. I was, you know, the only, like one of the only minorities who participated in fencing at my school in Maplewood, New Jersey. And um, I remember my, my friends asking me and questioning why I was joining the fencing team. They're like, you know, that's not, that's not cool. You know, it's not cool, like we're not doing that. And I just remember being like, nope, I wanna go to a, I wanna go to a good university, right? And that was like my first initial plan and why I started fencing. But, um, you know, at, even as an American athlete, I see how sport has changed my life and the things that I've been afforded, like going to an amazing university and even from the early stages, the the development that I've had, whether that be like strong social skills or um, even just that, that way to interact with my peers and know what it's like to be a part of a team. And it's really important, I think, when we think of our girls and their development, um, not just within the United States, but globally, how that affects how women and, and girls feel about themselves and the opportunities that sports creates. I, I realize that as an American, even um, for us, it, it just reaches so much further than what happens um, you know, on the sports field. Given fencing's history, I mean, how were you accepted both originally as a, as a high schooler by the probably predominantly white kids you were fencing with, and then as you reached, as you became an elite fencer, how were you received by you know, the, the US fencing community? It definitely like, hasn't always been easy, um, especially when you think of yourself as a kid and people questioning whether or not you belong, belong for something 
as, you know, uh, superficial in a sense of skin color. And I remember from, you know, a very early age just wondering why my skin color or even my religion made other people uncomfortable. And that was something that I had to deal with, you know, at 13, 14, 15 years old. And now that as I've progressed in the sport of fencing and I've now been a member of Team USA for the past, I think, six years, um, I see that it, even at the elite level, it's not, it's not easy for minority athletes, especially within the sport of fencing. And um, it definitely makes me um, want to excel even more so because I want um, it to be easier for minorities that come after me within the sport. I, I see that, you know, fencing, for example, isn't as accessible for people of color um, as it should be. Like in New Jersey, we may have 70, 80 high schools that have fencing, but it's still not available in inner city schools, for example. So um, just based on that uh, statistic alone, you do have a decrease in minority involvement. Um, okay, I want to shift over to uh, Becca for a second. Um, you just set new Paralympic world records and you're bring and you just brought home gold for the US in the 100 meter butterfly and the 100 and the 400 meter freestyle. So congratulations. Um, you've achieved this despite being born with Usher syndrome, which has left you deaf and with progressive vision loss. Tell us how swimming has empowered you despite these obstacles and what keeps you motivated to keep achieving this success? So I started swimming when I was about six years old because I tried many different sports along the way. I'm the youngest of three, so my brother and my sister were always doing soccer, baseball, tennis, and I was trying everything, but I was always falling down. I couldn't see the ball. I couldn't hear what was going on in the field. So I found swimming in the water and it just made me feel free. So I would go to school all day, listen really, really hard in the classroom, twice as hard as everyone else, come home, do homework, and then go to the pool and take my cochlear implants off, and I just felt free in the water for once. And that was the reward of after a long day of listening. So as I got older, I became better at swimming because swimming gave me confidence to be me. I wasn't the disabled kid in the classroom. I wasn't, or in the pool, I was just Becca, the swimmer. That's how my identity became about growing up, and it gave me confidence in the classroom, in the pool. It gave me the ability to advocate for myself, and why I do it now is because I want to share my story with everyone with the dis disability, community with the Paralympics that you can do anything. Just because you have a disability doesn't mean you're limited. You can find a sport and go forward with it and be successful. And now, now that you've uh, achieved this success and gained a voice of sorts, I mean, do you want to shift into like outreach and working with kids or do both? I mean, do you plan to keep I swimming competitively? Love, I would love to do both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, our last panelist is Lex Gillette, who just uh, won the silver medal in the long jump in Rio. Uh, this was your fourth straight time in the Paralympic Games, which is pretty amazing. Uh, you've done all this despite losing your sight around the age of eight. Uh, one of your famous quotes is that once you lost your sight, you've gained a vision. Can you speak to us about that quote and how, you know, these international events such as the Paralympic Games allow you to keep breaking barriers, you know, individually and for society? Yes. So when I lost my sight, it was a really difficult time for me. I know that I was in a space where I felt disconnected from the human race. And, and I think that it was all because of I, I couldn't see anymore. And we place a lot of importance on being able to see. You know, we see each other, we can make eye contact, we see facial expressions. And 
I couldn't do those things anymore. I couldn't watch TV. Um, I didn't think that I would be able to ride my bicycle or run around outside and play with friends anymore. But fortunately, I have a really amazing group of people who support me, my family, my mom especially, friends, teachers, and they told me that although I couldn't see, I still would be able to go out and achieve a lot of things. I just wouldn't be able to see those things with my eyes. So, you know, they, they got me involved in into uh, sports, and you know, I had involvement in a lot of resources that helped impact my life. But once I was in high school, that's when I was introduced to sport, Paralympic sport, and it totally, it changed my life. So I remember... You know, the doctors told me at a young age that I would never see again, but sport gave me that opportunity to see potential within myself. And when I talk about vision, sport gave me that ability to have a vision for who I wanted to become and where I wanted to go. And so I had so many amazing uh, teachers, one teacher in particular, who he always wanted to involve everyone in in, in sports. So there was no, you know, in, in elementary school, I can remember times where we would go outside for recess and if the teacher saw that it was an act activity that wasn't what they thought uh, safe for me to, to be involved in, I was, oh, you know, well, you can, you can sit this one out or, you know, you go back to the classroom and, and get started on your homework. And, and that makes you feel like inadequate and, and you know less than because now I'm not being included in in the sports and what's going on. Whereas my teacher in high school, he was totally the opposite. He wanted everyone to be involved in sports. And and just to give you an example of that, um, I was really good at at jumping. I, we had a standing long jump competition in my high school. I continued to go to public school, so I was one of a handful of sight impaired kids in our school. But I was one of the best jumpers. And so he had taken me outside one day, and, and he taught me about running long jump. And he said, you know, I think you can really be successful in this sport. Now, mind you, I was, you know, I was pretty confident in myself. I wasn't that confident yet, though. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he told me that, you know, we can adapt this. Let's turn this into something that you can be successful in. So in long jump, he, he would stand by the takeoff board, and he would clap, and he would yell. So that would give me an audible reference as to where I needed to run and jump from. And it was my responsibility to remember how many strides I would take, run as straight as possible, run as fast as possible. And at my last stride, I would jump and, um, you know, pray to God I would land in the sand. <laughs> so uh, we, 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 it got to the point where, you know, I, it, like being involved in that, it, again, it gave me that vision. It was like, oh, wow, you know, I can, I can see myself doing amazing things. My self-esteem rose tremendously. I was confident, and, and as Becca mentioned about feeling free, I had so many people who, you know, they have expectations for you and, and different things, um, different, um, you know, ideas of what you should and what you shouldn't do, but running and jumping became my thing, and it was like someone opened, you know, this cage door, and I was able to run and be free and fly as far as my mind could carry me. So, you know, now that I've seen the power of sport. I, I love to use the platform, whether it's through Paralympic sport or through speaking engagements, to let people know that you know, sport is amazing and, and, and it's out there for everyone. And as long as we practice that, that, um, that idea of inclusion, you know, we really preach that you know, unity and, and raising self-esteem, raising that self-confidence and there's so many you know, skills that are taught in sport that help us in, in our, our individual lives. That's great. You, you said you, you used it. It was kind of something that you, know, you said to yourself, I'm going to make the most I can of, of sport. And in your case, it was long jump. When did it shift to, I mean, were you just thinking this is a chance to be part of a high school team and uh, you know, be around friends and be part of a team. When did, when did your goals shift to, wow, I, I can actually take this, this could take me around the world. You know, how did that shift take place? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. 
I think that it shifted. So after I came back from Beijing, up until that point, I was still in school. So you know, I was trying to get my work done and, and, and make sure I graduated from, from high school and college. And once I had gotten out, it was like, you know, now I'm, I, I have to figure out what I'm going to do. I'm a young adult. I, I'm in the world. And so I, I, I looked back on my life, and I was just like, all right, where do I, where do I go from here? And through sport, it's opened up so many doors for me. And um, I realized that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I, I've been able to do a lot of things, and I've bl been blessed with a lot of success. But I honestly feel like it's, you know, it's really not about me. It's about how I can use my platform to impact the lives of other people. And so after Beijing, you know, grasping that concept and really believing in that idea, you know, helped me to, to impact more people, to go out there and, you know, show kids who are disabled that they can, too, participate in sports. And to show them that, you know, through sport, there's so many skills that you learn and so many skills that you acquire that help you in, in your pursuit of being an athlete, but also in your pursuit of being an amazing human being. That's excellent. Um, that, that, that leads well into another topic um, we wanted to touch on, which is you know, how sports have evolved. Um, I want to bring it back to Ibtihaj. Um, it was 1964, so uh, you know, half a lifetime ago, a little more than that, that uh, the former Cassius Clay, uh, who had become Muhammad Ali, went public with his belief in Islam, and you know that was a huge shock to much of America, and he was criticized any number of ways, obviously, and and vilified that changed over the course of his lifetime as it relates to Muhammad Ali. He became beloved, sure, and his recent death, you could see that. That said, you know, has the world changed how they look at uh, the religion of Islam and Muslim athletes? You know, like, did, did you see anything in, in his lifetime or in the recent, you know, years of it that made you feel better about society, or was it just he became a sympathetic figure and there was love for him, but there's still a lot of work as a society towards people of that religion, especially in America? Um, so uh, Muhammad Ali at the height of his career is a little bit before my time, but uh, <laughs> my, <course>. yeah. <laughs> but when I think of um, Muhammad Ali, especially like uh, in his recent passing, as you know, a younger generation, just seeing a lot of the videos that have been posted and having this amazing opportunity to watch a lot of his interviews and see the not just the work that he did in the ring, but the work that he did outside of the ring um, from just uh, the social perspective and the gains that he made for society and being so vocal and verbal, not just about his religion, but also about who he was as an African American. And the injustices that, you know, uh, religious and ethnic minorities face in this country. And he, as an athlete, was like, I'm not standing for it. And we as a country need to change. Um, like, I was talking to my mom a bit about this today. I'm like, you know, I was really thinking about uh, how, um, like, trying to take that question apart a little bit. and. Um, when I think of Islam and how it, you know, relates to us in this time and space right now, of course it's very different than, you know, what it was some 40 some odd years ago. When uh, Muhammad Ali first, like, you know, uh, accepted Islam, um, you know, formerly Cassius Clay and accepted Islam, became Muhammad Ali, for a lot of Americans that was the first time they had even, you know, really heard this term and now could put not just a face to you know, what a Muslim looks like, but then also it kind of breaks that notion of, you know, Muslims being Arab or, um, you know, even being American and seeing, you know, a black American accept Islam. And like a lot of people even now today don't know that the, like a whopping 30% of Muslim Americans are African Americans. And so now having me um, be the first Muslim woman uh, in hijab to represent Team USA, 
um, I feel like still, you know, decades later, I still feel like it's challenging that idea of who, who Muslims are, you know, how a Muslim can look, um, and even uh, just challenging the misconceptions that people have about women who wear hijab. Um, like I know Lee talked a lot about, you know, just barriers that people set for you because they perceive their things that, you know, you can't do because of whether that be a disability or um, even like for me as a kid wearing hijab, there were there are things that people told me I couldn't do because I was a Muslim girl, you know. So um, I, I'm not, I don't think I, um, that things necessarily compare to the times of, you know, when Muhammad Ali was like at the height of his career and he was using his platform um, to, to change the rhetoric around the Muslim community, to change the, um, the, even the condition of minorities, specifically black Americans in this country. But I do feel like there are, you know, strides that we need to make um, in order to improve the condition of the Muslim community, in particular right now, um, uh, in light of just even the, the conversation around um, this presidential campaign. Okay, um, switching over to Becca and Lex. Um, the International Paralympic Committee President, Sir Philip Craven, has spoken about the improved television and online coverage of this year's Paralympics will help boost awareness of people with disabilities. You know, just as a generalist sports fan, I felt like the awareness was higher. I mean, I, I, I was watching, you know, games on NBC proper, um, actually with my daughter on, on Sunday, and, you know, that started an interesting and really nice conversation, I thought. And it was not because I was hosting this. It was just, you know, we were watching, we were watching the rugby. Um, you know, throughout the, the games, I felt like there was a little more uh, publicity than past games. I, I wanted to jump to Lex, who this was your fourth uh, Paralympics. I mean, have things changed? I know that you probably personally don't care about, you know, celebrity or anything like that, but obviously you have a story to share. The more people that are watching the games, talking about the games on social media, on the internet, on television, Obviously, that's going to create a wider audience for your message. So, you know, how, how, if you go back to Beijing, to Rio, you know, can you talk about the differences in maybe attendance, media coverage, and how you felt about them? Yeah, so, oh man, Athens 2004 compared to now, it's night and day different. And for me, Athens, I was, I was super young, still a teenager at the time. So, you know, those things I, I wasn't really focused on as much, but we didn't have, I can't even really remember too much coverage in, in Athens. Go over to Beijing. Now we have, you know, a highlight show after, after we returned from, from Beijing. So you were able to see a few performances from, from the competition. And then London was a similar type of ordeal. I think we got a little more you know, a little more time within that, that highlight show. But now you fast forward to Rio, where we had 70 hours of coverage across you know, a lot of the sports, swimming, track and field, the wheelchair rugby, wheelchair basketball, sitting volleyball. And it's been amazing. I know, you know, my, my Twitter feed was, was going crazy during the games, which is, you know, I like that, of course. And um, so, you know, having, having the, you know, everyone talking about Paralympic sport and seeing it, being involved in it, you know, and, and engaging with the content is really amazing. And, and to have that coverage on NBC is really incredible because now, you know, people are seeing it and, and hopefully there are kids who have a disability, maybe they're watching as well. And I know kids, they, they, they gravitate to so many things. And if they see something that, um, you know, if they see someone who's in a similar situation as they are, then, you know, that, that ignites something within them. So if they see a Becca Myers and, you know, maybe they're dealing with sight loss or if they see a Tatiana McFadden and, and that particular kid is, is um, you know, in a wheelchair, they see these athletes and that, that creates that, that will within and that energy within. And so now they're wanting to go out 
and pursue that sport as well. And that's what continues to grow Paralympic sports. So I think that the, the NBC coverage was amazing, and hopefully that is something that will continue for 2020 so we can continue to, to grow sport and have more athletes and, and continue to um, use that sport as, you know, as a catalyst for, for change in, in our personal lives also. Great. Yeah, I wanted to pose a similar question to Becca. This was your second straight Paralympics. You were, you know, an absolute star here. You've just told us you want to keep swimming competitively. So as you look ahead to 2020, are there things as far as um, the way you guys are treated by media, fans, that, you know, you'd like, that you saw in Rio that you'd like repeated in uh, Tokyo or things that you want, you know, what would you like to maybe see different in 2020? So when I started in London, after each race I swam in and I would walk through the mixed media zone, there were no cameras, there was no, like, interview requests or anything. This time around, walking through the media zone in Rio, oh my gosh, it was incredible. The NBC coverage was amazing. I can't, you know, thank them enough for giving us many more hours than London because all of us deserve to share our story through media because that's the way the world works these days is through the media. So going to Tokyo, more media would be great for Paralympics. And that's what I want to work on as well is promoting Paralympics through the media so that Lex, Tatiana, all of us deserve to share our story to get our story out there. Great. Um, in a couple minutes, we'll, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. But, you know, as a lead into that, um, this is sort of a, a similar question. I'll pose it to, you know, all three of you, basically. Let's look to the future, not just Tokyo or in the Olympic vein, but just as a country, as, as a world. Um, you know, how can sport continue to evolve and be inclusive and what are people you know what can the regular person do maybe not an olympian not a member of the media but just uh you know regular nine to five american who cares about sports cares about people you know what what can we all be doing to create access and you know so more people can have the experiences that that you guys had, even on a smaller scale. If you go back to, you all spoke about age 12, high school, age six, like discovering sports effectively changed your lives. So what can we all be doing so that that experience can be shared uh, by more kids and, and more people? Um, I, I started, um when I started fencing, I was at a local high school fencing tournament, or yeah, like like a local tournament, and someone told me that there were black people who fenced in New York, and I remember being like, I'm from New Jersey, and I remember being- You're Westbrook. Yeah, right? So I remember being like offended, but I remember going home and telling my mom like, oh my God, mom, there are black people who fence, <laughs> right? So my mom like got online and she figured out, you know, where the program was in New York and that's when we discovered this huge nonprofit here in New York City um, that was started by uh, an Olympic bronze medalist from the 1988 games, uh, Peter Westbrook. And, you know, I know what nonprofit organization has done for my life in sport. So I would say if anyone who's looking, you know, to help children in their involvement in sport, I would say to like, you know, get out there and give back. Um, just having that exposure and me seeing minorities be successful in the sport of fencing, that opened my eyes past, you know, competing on the local level. I never saw my life in sport past high school or past college even until I saw, you know, other athletes who look like me really excelling and being on, you know, U.S. World Championship teams and winning Olympic medals that um, just changed my perspective and how I viewed my career in sports. So I see what nonprofit, what nonprofits um, have done for my life in sport and I would just encourage people to give back so kids who normally wouldn't have that opportunity um, can be afforded one. That's a, that's a great example. Um, Becca or Lex, do, do you guys have any thoughts on, you know, things that people can do to 
to again create some of the opportunities that that you guys had. Okay. Yeah, Lex, go ahead. Okay, okay. I didn't want to didn't want to uh, cut back off. She wanted to say something, but um, just to piggyback on what I don't want to mess your name up. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, Miss Miss Lady at the end. <laughs> um, that works. But just yes. But to piggyback off what she was saying is, you know, just placing an importance on those grassroots programs and, and really knowing that sport is, you know, sport is so phenomenal. And, you know, I just think about all of the times where, you know, funding is amazing and it's, and it's great to have funding for the sporting programs that are out there, but just having people, myself, all of us up here, you guys in the, in the audience, you ladies and gentlemen, and, and people outside of this building, just knowing that, you know, investing your time and really showing that you want to see, uh, you know, these youth succeed. And having someone there with me when I lost my sight um, and, and, you know, being in high school, having that person there to give me that guidance and that advice and to show me that I still can be involved in sports. And, you know, just another example, I think about, you know, we would go outside and, and, and shoot basketball. Everyone's shooting baskets and making baskets. And, and at that time, I didn't think I could do it. But again, that same teacher I had who introduced me to track and field, he would take my cane and he would tap the basketball rim. So now I would be able to hear where to shoot the ball. And you just don't know how much that, like, made me feel to be able to shoot and to sometimes hear the ball actually go inside of the net. Like... <laughs> That was that is life altering, <clears throat> and those moments right there are what help help build us as as people. And so I think that as long as we you know continue to fund those programs, continue to invest time into those programs, and you know um, just use as much as possible, um, you know that example that I just gave you that. that doesn't really take too much. It just takes a cane and, and, you know, someone who, you know, has that mindset to, you know, think of how to make it accessible and adapt it for, for those who, you know, most people don't think are able to be involved in those things. So um, that, that's what I would say. And, you know, I think that would just it would make our world a better place. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Becca, anything you want to add on this? He summed it up He's perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> he did a good job. All right, we have a, a few minutes. It's not super easy for me to see everyone out there, but we did want to, you know, give give the audience an Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple more minutes with these guys before we switch to a different panel. Does anyone in the audience have any questions for them? Right there in the middle. Well, so I, so I apologize. Um, I'm curious, usually after the Olympics, and you're one of the breakout stars, the brand community tends to gravitate towards them. Given the challenges of the culture in this country right now, have you felt there's been any more acceptance for that, or are you still feeling the, the challenges and fear of backlash? Um, from a sponsor perspective? Um, you know, that's a question that I actually have gotten a lot, especially uh, prior to even, like once I qualified um, back in February, prior to the start of the Olympic Games. And I've always said that whatever's meant for me will never miss me, right? In a sense where if someone, you know, um, like, a, you know, wants to work with me and I feel like it's a genuine uh, relationship, then it'll work. And for those companies that don't want to work with me because of, you know, something like my religion, for example, than that I didn't want to work with them anyway. And the the companies that I've been like fortunate enough to to work with, like Visa or Mini, um, the the premise of you know even their Olympic campaigns have all been about inclusion and about acceptance. So for me, being different and defying these stereotypes and labels that people have attributed to me, whether that be race or religion or even gender. I feel like there's always been this genuine relationship that I have with the, spot, with the, the companies that I've been blessed to work with. And um, I personally haven't had any issues. And for those companies that didn't want to work with me for X, Y, Z reasons, I didn't want to work with them anyway. So. <laughs> I 
guess this is for all three of you. Um, social media can be a blessing and a curse. And um, I know folks can be really critical and they can be positive. And I'm just wondering what your experience has been. I know athletes use social as a great way to build their brands and, and what sort of reaction you've gotten um, during your competitive days. Let's let's start with Lex because yeah. he actually mentioned his uh, Twitter feed. So. Yeah, I so I've gotten a lot of you know amazing things that have been said, and you know the opposite end of the spectrum. I've had things that weren't so nice that were said as well. And I'll give you an example. Last year in Doha, Qatar, we had our World Championships, and there was one particular attempt that I that I took in long jump and when I jumped for whatever reason I just my body shifted a little bit and so I landed to the side of the of the pit so I landed on the track instead of inside of the sand and it was a really you know it, it was definitely um you know it was painful but it was something that we were able to get back to regroup and the the very next attempt I had the best jump of my of the competition and that's what won me gold and so on social media the videos, you know, it's traveling around, and you know, people they migrate to like things that aren't so nice, I guess. And um, so people are saying, like, "Oh my gosh, like this guy is crazy. He's like, he, his stunt went wrong, and all this other stuff." And in my mind, I'm kind of like, I really don't see covering my eyes and running down a long jump pit as like a cool stunt to do. Like this is this is competition. I'm representing my country. And there, there's been a whole bunch of other things that, you know, weren't so nice. But, um, I mean, it's just, that's just the way of the world. You know, people have their, their ideas. And, and when you have social media, it, it's accessible to all people. We all have phones. We all, you know, a lot of us have Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all of those things. And so you have that ability to, to give your input and, and your insight on whatever that is. So, um, I mean, you just have to have, you know, thicker skin and just know that, you know, people do have that ability, and, and you know, you just you just kind of you know deflect it and just continue to go out there and and be amazing athletes. Thank you, uh, Becca or Ibtaj, Any social media thoughts? So I look at social media as a positive thing for me because I want to share my story. So of course, there's going to be like Lex said, the spectrum of great and the downfalls. I try not to pay attention to the downfalls because that's not why I do swimming. That's not why I represent Team USA. I represent Team USA because I want to share my story and help young kids with disabilities. So I look at social media and try and use it as a positive way. When, and when we, when we even, uh, like if we think of like the state of like the Muslim community or even like what's going on um, within like a, with the national anthem or like kneeling on the football field. Um, when we look at how public people are and the things that they have to say, right? I feel like that is like times a million on social media for athletes and celebrities and public figures. And people can be so mean and degrading and derogatory like I personally don't feel like racial epithets have a place on social media I don't think that people should be able to tweet them be able to post them on Facebook I wish I was like I could do coding and find a way that they you know like wouldn't even go through um, like Becca said that you know you want you you want to turn a blind eye to these things I wish that I didn't have to read them on Facebook for example or even on Instagram but I feel like as a athlete in the public eye, um, because we do have children that you know are watching the things that we do and reading our stories and find um, a, find us as a source of inspiration. I'm very diligent in deleting those comments from my page and blocking. Like I will block you if you have anything negative to say to me. I will block you. Um, but that's because I don't want other people out there to in any way be deterred from you know, reaching their goals because someone has something negative to say about women or about black people or about Muslims or whatever it is. So um, I think that the trolling has, I don't know if it's for everyone, but for me, I feel like it's just gotten really bad, especially after, you know, even winning a medal in the games. And I'm just very active in deleting and blocking. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, that's a that's a very real answer. Um, we got time for one more. If if anyone has anything, right here. Hi, um, Lex. You mentioned uh, a teacher and your mother, and this question is for all three. Um, is there one or two specific people who sort of ignited a spark? And a second part to that question: What was the defining um, characteristic or component that was the magic recipe? Becca, I don't know if you were able to hear that one, but she's asking, you know, Lex mentioned a specific teacher. Uh, was there one or two people in particular that helped you reach your swimming goals and what characteristics did they, did they have? So I would have to say my family that they're sitting in the audience right now, my mom, my sister, Lisa. <laughs> Um, they were there every step of the way. They, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So they they supported me. They, you know, I always had a place to go home to after a long day of, you know, working hard, and they were always there to helped me get back up and they were like, you can do this, just don't listen to the, you know, negative comments, you can go to the pool, be free, you know. It was just really nice, they were always there for me to lean on when times got tough, yeah. All right, and lastly, Abtaj, any, any, you know, was it your mother or a, or a coach and, you know, what did, what did they do that, that worked so well? Um, I'll answer this question as quickly as I can, but, um, you know, from a really young age, my mom always told me I could do whatever I wanted, I could be whatever I wanted, um, as long as I was willing to work hard for it. And I remember, like, uh, just, like, even, like, you know, when you didn't do well or you didn't have the result that you wanted, my mom was always there, like, you know, um, shoulder to lean on in a way, but also would, like, push you, you know, to say, like, okay, well, what's next? Are you willing to work harder to reach your next goal? Um, when I switched coaches in 2009, um, my coach, uh, this was before I even qualified for a United States World Championship team, he was the first person to tell me that I could be great in sport. And at that time, I had no national ranking, no international ranking, had never even been to a senior competition. And um, I thought he was crazy, but, you know, here we are, right? Um, so I feel like it was just that one person telling me that I could be amazing that kind of planted this seed. Um, and then I would say now, as on the elite level, working with coaches who don't believe in me um, and who have never really believed in me, ha I, it sparked something in me, this Olympic qualifying uh, process, to just, you know, say it doesn't matter, like, the, the necessarily not having the support team that I was looking for around me um, while traveling alone to all these different World Cups throughout the year and just finding that support and strength within myself and believing in myself, I feel like, um, was the determining factor to qualifying for this United States Olympic team. Okay, thanks. And Lex has got something else to yeah, say. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, because she said all three, so I was I forgot. I say all three. <laughs> but I just wanted to say, so that question really, that resonates with me because my mom and I, we had the opportunity to do a, a Thank You Mom commercial earlier this year. And so it's been, it's been playing. But in that, in that spot, my mom says that Alexis, because she calls me by my full name, Alexis, it does not matter what anyone says, you decide what you can do and no one else. And I've always taken that statement with me everywhere that I go. It started in at home, um, it's taken me into sports, I, I use it in sports. So if I, if I, in my mind, if I believe that I can do it, and I have these outside influences that may say, oh no, you can't, like that stuff, it just doesn't even factor into my thought process because it does not matter what anyone says. If I believe that I can do it, then I'm the one that decides whether or not that happens. That's a great note to finish on. Thank, thank you all so very, very much.
Okay. Well, that was pretty amazing. Really, three extremely inspiring athletes, and I, again, it's 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 absolutely an honor to share the stage with them. Um, we have a second panel, which I hope will be equally enlightening, and I want to introduce our two panelists for that. Um, the first one is Jason Collins, a Goodwill ambassador and retired player from the National Basketball Association who now works for the league. Uh, Jason, please join us. And uh, secondly is Casey Wasserman, the chairman and CEO of Wasserman, and he's also the chairman of the LA 2024 committee, which maybe you could tell us a little about, but I believe is the favorite to get the 2024 Olympics. Thank you both uh, for joining us. Um, we're going to start with Casey. Uh, in 1998, you founded what has become one of the world's leading sports agencies, the Wasserman Media Group, and you're also chairing the LA 2024 committee, which is tasked with pitching Los Angeles, I guess, to the IOC as a host site for the 2024 Olympics. Um, having you know been a part of sports from a lot of different angles, can you talk about, from your perspective, you know, how can the private sector help to break some of the barriers that exist in sports access that our previous panelists uh, just discussed, and maybe some of the opportunities you've seen that either you personally or Wasserman have been able to you know, tackle to help in, in those regards? Well, first, I just want to... Uh Congratulate the the, pan, the 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 athletes before us. I was uh, had the fortune of being both at the Olympics and the Paralympics, and um, uh, the way that those athletes represented um, Team USA and, and this country uh, in their respective sports was spectacular, and they all deserve uh, a round of applause for their great success um, in competition. Um, Actually, you know, look, I think in uh, sports is one of the great examples where the private sector is leveraging um, its uh, access, its, its reach, its leverage, its financial power um, to create more opportunities for more people, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, the U.S. Olympic Committee and Paralympic Committee providing opportunities for athletes to compete and excel, whether it's the NBA and their efforts to uh, expose the sport of basketball to, to more people around the world, um, through their programs that, that Jason knows so well. Um, I think the private sector does a lot, and sport is one of the great equalizers I think we have. Um, as Ibtihaj talks about, you know, her ability to tell her story, which is extraordinary, through sport is special and unique. Um, I don't, her story isn't different, but the sport of fencing and her success as an Olympian and athlete has created an incredible platform for her to tell that story. Uh, and sport was the means through which she, she excelled. Um, and I think that there's lots of examples of that, but the, the private sector really has done a lot. You know, philanthropy as a part of sport is, is a big part of it. Well, most people don't know that, um, and, and it's important to, for people to keep in mind that uh, the U.S. Olympic Committee and the Paralympic Committee, which is ostensibly one organization in the United States, uh, is the only, we are the only developed country on earth that does not uh, have its government support its athlete training. Uh, so these athletes you saw uh, up here uh, are, are the opportunities afforded them are 100% through private sector support. Um, so I think that uh, that's a great example of what um, private enterprise, private individuals, private philanthropy, private corporations uh, do in this country through sport to support them in, in their pursuit of excellence. Thank you. Um, you know, the Olympics... Host, hosting the Olympics, you know, I think was once seen as universally a positive as media has examined closer. Obviously, there was a lot of coverage around Rio. You know, was it appropriate? Was the city ready? Los Angeles has hosted, you know, this is not a developing city by any stretch of the imagination, but 
you know, there might be displacement, there's gonna be costs, there's obviously a lot of positives too. I mean, talk, I mean, I'm curious just personally, like what, what would it mean to you uh, for Los Angeles to host it and what are the positives that in your mind, both for the city and the country and the athletes that just blow away, presumably the negatives in your mind that make it uh, a pursuit worth uh, undertaking? Well, I, I, I'm fairly certain if I lived in any other city in this country, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be taking on this responsibility. But Los Angeles is truly unique, not because we hosted the Olympics in 1984, but because of the city that Los Angeles is. So we have the ability to host the games uh, today. 97% of our venues exist or will be built regardless of the games by 2024. So we have to build one permanent venue, which is a canoe kayak facility. Um, other than that, every venue exists. Our Athletes Village today exists at UCLA. Uh, sort of the hidden gem of, not hidden if you live in LA, but the hidden gem of, of our Olympic efforts is USC and UCLA. It's the only city in this country uh, that has two universities at that scale, 10 miles from each other, uh, with that athletic infrastructure. And the combination of their size of student body and the um, uh, scale of their athletic programs is a huge platform that makes our bid pretty unique. Uh, and so to us, uh, it, it's a games that will be about the experience of the games as opposed to the construction and the delivery of the games. And because we would have seven years to focus on the experience of the games, we think that you know, it will allow us to take all the creativity and innovation that is sort of what makes LA special uh, and help deliver, you know, as we like to say, a new games for a new era. And that's about exposing the world to these athletes' stories. It's about uh, energizing a community. Um, I tend to think that America is better when it's engaged in the world than when it's not engaged in the world, and there may not be a greater way to engage with the world than Olympic Games. Hosting 207 countries, uh, there are actually more countries with Olympic committees than there are countries that are members of the UN. Uh, and so it's a really unique opportunity. Uh, we think LA is uniquely positioned to host the games. We're competing uh, today against three great cities in Paris, Rome, and Budapest. So it's, I appreciate you saying we're the front runner. I really would like to be the front runner on September 13th, 2017, and not a day before then, because that's the day they vote. Uh, I like to be a close second until then. Um, just nip them at the, at the end. Um, and so uh, we're, we're, we're very focused on that. But you know, think about what LA could do for an Olympic and Paralympic athlete in terms of a platform to tell their story, uh, in terms of a community to get excited about what they're doing, and, and we're very excited about the opportunity. Thank you, that was a great answer. Um, shifting over to Jason, uh, you played in the NBA for 13 seasons for six different teams. You appeared in the NBA Finals twice. This was after a very successful uh, college career at Stanford. Um, during your career, you came out as the first publicly gay athlete to play in a, for, you know, in a major sport in North America. And if I'm not mistaken, still the only if we don't count Major League Soccer. So. Well, we can count soccer. Okay. Well, <laughs> Robbie I Rogers. know it's have the four, but you know, so you were you were definitely the first, and you know, you well, the, the first male athlete. The first male. Women have been doing this for decades. For a long time. <laughs> first male athlete. Thank you. Um, and you know, you you, you said uh, obviously that wasn't a that that was not a career goal. That wasn't something you were thinking about. You were just doing your thing as, as a pro player, but you know, things happened personally or in society that made you feel comfortable enough doing so. Um, and you've said you were happy that you started a conversation. I mean, can you talk about what that experience was like a few years ago and what you think it's done since then, you know, if not for straight people, at least for other lesbian, gay, trans transgender athletes, uh, in the wake of you coming out and speaking so openly? Well, I, I reached a point in my private life where I told uh, my family members and my closest friends uh, that I was gay and I was ready to come out publicly. Um, I was playing for the Boston Celtics and got traded from the Boston Celtics to the Washington Wizards in February of 2013. Um, at that time, my agent, uh, Arne Tellum, who former uh, employee of Casey, uh, Team Wasserman, all the way. <laughs> um, I spoke to Arn, and I said that I'm tired of going to a, a different city, a new team, and telling this, this lie about having a girlfriend who doesn't exist in you know, another city. And 
uh, I, I was ready to come out publicly. And um, like the final straw for me was playing for the Washington Wizards in 2013, in March of 2013, when DOMA and Prop 8 were being argued at the Supreme Court. Here I was, a professional athlete, living less than three miles away from the Supreme Court. And the impact of these cases were going to have a direct, uh, I mean, the, the results of these cases were going to have an impact on my, my happiness in life. And I was quiet at that time. And it, it was very difficult. And I also want to acknowledge my sister-in-law, who's also in the room. Um, she's one of those people in my support system who kept me strong. And uh, after that season was over, I made a decision to come out. Um, and we use Sports Illustrated as the vehicle to um, you know, tell my story on my own terms. And the reaction was uh, surreal at times, like getting back-to-back -back calls from Oprah Winfrey and President Obama. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> that was a pretty cool experience. <laughs> um, but, you know, sports and entertainment music, but sports in a way, it's, I remember having a conversation, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna name drop a little uh, with uh, Vice President Biden. And <laughs> I was having a conversation with him and how he said that it's sometimes it's difficult for two straight guys to have a conversation about LGBT issues. However, when you put it in the context of sports, it's easier. It's an easy way to kick off the conversation and say, hey, did you see that basketball player who came out? Or did, hey, did you see that football player who came out? Or um, and it's an easier way for them to talk about um, you know, issues that, that are happening in our country. Um, and like I, I, again, I have to acknowledge that women have been doing this for decades. I mean, I, one of my heroes, one of my idols is Martina Navratilova and uh, Billie Jean King. And, you know, they came out in the 70s and 80s. And in Billie Jean's case, um, she really didn't have a choice. Like she was, she got outed. And that's part of the reason why I came out the way I did is I wanted to control my story. I wanted to be able to tell my story on my own terms. And I was able to do that. Thank you. Um, we we talked a little, um, you know, with the with the Olympics over how sport has evolved and um, on a racial level, religious level. I think that we're seeing right now, uh, you know, rooted in some absolutely tragic incidents in this country, particularly with police and people of color, but I think we've seen players, um, pro players speaking out in a way that uh, we haven't in a long time. I think athletes are trying to connect with their community, quite possibly, literally, definitely via social media, via Snapchat, you know, via Instagram with posts that move the conversation along. Um, so I have sort of similar question for both of you, but I guess I'll, I'll start with, with Casey. I mean, you know, you've made your mark representing, or your company representing athletes for a long time. Um, whether this was true or not, the impression was, you know, we don't want our, you know, athletes aren't supposed to speak out that might kill their next endorsement deal. You know, I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, am I right that guys are, guys and girls are, are speaking out more? And, you know, do you see that as a challenge to their earning potential? Is there an opportunity there? Do you want your guys to just do them, whatever the course may be? But what is the, you know, what are the business implications, uh, you know, on and off the field for, for athletes speaking out the way we're seeing a lot lately? Well, um, I think first and foremost, it, it shouldn't be, and I think if I made a good point, it shouldn't be a business uh, decision. This is a personal decision. And uh, look, we represent Megan Rapino, who's been um, very uh, outspoken in her kneeling during the anthem, different than Colin Kaepernick and other athletes because she actually is playing for Team USA when she's, she's playing for her country as opposed to a professional team. So there are all sorts of issues, and I have no problem, and I think athletes should use the platforms they have to voice their opinions. Um, my, only, my only point is I, I want those opinions and the follow-up to them to be as authentic as the feelings that are forcing them. So, you know, the, 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 the ills that are, are causing athletes to take the stand have, happen, have been existing for a long time. 
and they will continue to exist long after they stand during the national anthem. And so I hope that their engagement and, and belief uh, and, and concern with the issues continues. I hope it's not limited to social media because I think that's not the way uh, we're going to solve these problems. These problems are solved really in a very uh, personal, engaged way. And so I would encourage the athletes who, are, who have whatever particular social uh, issue that's giving them pause to engage with that issue fully um, because it's the right thing for them personally. And the authenticity that comes from that, frankly, may produce better business benefits than the lack of authenticity. But these are not business decisions, nor should they be looked at through a business lens. Uh, frankly, um, most athletes will earn 99% of their earnings from their playing their sport, not the endorsements that come around their sport. There are exceptions to that, clearly. Uh, and so as long as their skills are maintained, their highest potential for earning power will continue. Um, but for me, what's important is not kneeling during the national anthem or not. It's what are you doing beyond just kneeling for the national anthem? Because there's a lot that's going on in the communities that these athletes could have a tremendous impact on that I hope they take their platform and use it for, as opposed to just making a very public stand. Okay. Yeah, I want to echo everything that Casey just said. Uh, and the only other thing is just adding like an education component to it. Um, I recently attended, and uh, right after the Espies and Carmelo and LeBron, all the guys spoke, um, there was uh, a meeting with the leaders of Black Lives Matters, and they brought in some community leaders, they brought in some people from LAPD, and a lot of the athletes that were in town for the ESPYs uh, attended that event um, just to get more informed on the, uh, on the situation on, on, and on the issues at hand. Okay, and you know, Jason, a lot of this has been around race and you know, civil rights incredibly important cause. Um, the you know, gay rights discussion has not been that vocal with athletes you know, in this last stint at all. Um, there's a note here, 11, there were 11 openly gay male Olympians, none of them were American. Um, are you surprised or, you know, what, what is your take no, on, on the I, conversation that you started and if it's still continuing or? Yeah, there's still a lot of homophobia in, in male sports. Um, you know, it's interesting when you see uh, Elena Deladon, um, the reigning MVP of the WNBA, right before the Olympics started, she came out publicly and it was like a one day story and then it was about, <laughs> um, you know, Team USA, and, and I got to give a shout out to, uh, I mean, obviously I'm a huge fan of basketball, but uh, Team USA. I also was in Rio for the Olympics and saw uh, the men's and women's uh, gold medal game, and, you know, also our men's and women's uh, Paralympic team uh, in basketball also won gold, so. Clean sweep. Oh, yeah, yeah clean sweep for Team USA in basketball. But yeah, there's there's still a lot of work to be done, and uh, part of my work with the NBA is every year um, there's rookie transition program, which is where they bring in every incoming uh, basketball player who's going to be a future superstar in our league, and they sit them through about a week long uh, seminar, and they bring in speakers, and I'm one of the speakers, and I sp go with a guy named. Hudson Taylor, who uh, has an organization called Athlete Ally, and we talk to them about their language in the locker room, and we try to actually, because that's the only way is you're gonna to confront is you get to deal with these issues is to confront it, to talk about it. So uh, we talk about it with the guys and um, talk to them, because some, sometimes when guys are using homophobic language, uh, you know, I can speak from personal experience. Some of the guys that I heard use homophobic language when I came out were some of my biggest supporters. And they didn't really connect the two. You know, they were saying it uh, not to necessarily be homophobic, but saying it to, uh, I don't know, to insult. They thought that that was a way to insult. And um, it, so we talk about, you know, the language in the locker room and even using terms like when you're uh, younger in sports, you might hear the term like, don't play like a girl and like what that means. And like, we, we talk about that and that the negative impact that that uh, can have on, on guys. And um, so there's all kinds of uh, education and information that needs to happen in the NBA and I, I know the NFL, Major League Baseball, um, they're talking to the players and trying to uh, change the culture in sport and professional sport. Okay. Um, last question before we 
again, open it up for a few minutes to the audience. I, I want to look ahead. I mean, we talked 20 minutes ago um, about how the average person can help um, someone that might have a disability play sports more. The truth is there's tons of fully able-bodied kids that are obese, um, whether that's a personal decision, an economic situation, whether they have access and are skipping it or just don't even have access to proper training or sports. I mean, from, from where you guys sit, what should, you know, Americans be doing to help keep our kids active and create, uh, you know, what is obviously a healthy lifestyle? Even, I mean, the trickle down, we've all spoken about how it helps you professionally, teamwork, all that stuff. But even on a basic level, like, you got to stay moving or you're, you're going to be sick and not, not live a long and healthy life. So, you know, can, do you guys have any just kind of easy takeaways for, for people that can, you know, help influence the, the next generation to get and stay healthy? Well, um, I know the head of Alliance for a Healthier Generation is right over there. So <laughs> um, they're a great organization um, such as that that uh, work with, uh, you know, our youth. And I'm also on the President's Council for Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition. And one thing that we talk about, which is huge, is getting at least 60 minutes of physical activity every day. Now, um, I just went to a high school in Los Angeles uh, last week. Um, and they didn't offer any uh, physical education programs whatsoever in their, in their school. And I mean, they're not alone in this country, so we have to try to find ways. And I, I spoke with the principal about you know, brain breaks and like little, um, little things that they can do to try to incorporate some sort of physical activity in their school. Um, but, okay. No, I, I look, it's, uh, it's a real problem in this country. The Alliance has done an incredible job. Um, and I think athletes have served as, and can serve as even greater role models for these, these kids that, you know, look, being active isn't about being an NBA player. Being active is about being a healthy person. <laughs> and that's healthy physically and mentally. Uh, and look, the, 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 the good feeling, you know, I've never been a professional athlete, but I feel better as a human being when I'm active and working out. I feel healthier. and you know, whether it's parents to kids or professional athletes to kids or teachers, uh, I think we can all make a, a difference in, in the lives of understanding that, you know, the activity we do and the things we put in our body have a profound effect on our lives. Yeah, it's actually scientifically proven that active kids do better at school. Yeah. All right, well, th thank you guys very much. Um, some, some really nice insights. If we could get the lights up again and we can see if we got any questions from our audience. Thank you. Um, all right, we got, we got hands right away, right here. Um, we got a mic. Oh. Hi, uh, good morning, thank you, this was great. Um, so around, first of all, I was shocked with the uh, understanding that the US does not get any government support for its um, Olympic athletes. It, it blew my mind, because around the, Olympics and the Paralympics, um, there was a whole debate. I'm, I'm currently living in Israel. There was a whole debate about the fact that apparently the Paralympic athletes are getting about 25% of the budget compared to the Olympic athletes. And I'm sure that's probably a statistic that is relevant to other countries as well. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about the business case, because you know if it's the private sector that has the potential to inject money and and leverage this? What is the business case for the private sector, philanthropy, maybe even everyday people to, to gain more support and not rely solely on government to, to really shine a light on the, the inspiring stories of these athletes and their successes? Thank you. Well, you know, the, I mean, just to get in the weeds a little on the Paralympics, so the, the International Olympic Committee and the International Paralympic Committee are actually two separate organizations. Uh, with no uh, connectivity, they're in different. They're actually based in different countries. They have no financial arrangements. Um, to give you some history, 1984 Los Angeles Olympics, there wasn't even a Paralympics in LA. So it's a recent uh, evolution that those two events happened concurrently in the same city. Um, it has um, 
in the United States, it is one organization. The U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee is one organization. So every country has a different setting. Um, but look, I mean, the, the only thing the United States government gives the U.S. Olympic Committee is the right to use the Olympic rings. Uh, and that was the Stevens Act uh, from, from Senator Ted Stevens. Uh, and everything else, every other dollar sport comes from broadcast revenue, uh, sponsors, uh, and private individuals. Um, and, you know, I think our athletes, I mean, you know, when, when, when Team USA walks, and I certainly have not had the pleasure of doing it, but walks into an Olympic stadium, you know, there's this picture of, of um, Team USA walking out at the Olympics, and there's Michael Phelps with the flag, there's Iptahaj right next to him, and there's a few other athletes, and, you know, I, I, that, that's the face of America. That, that's the country that we are, and that, those stories are what are inspire us, I think, to be a better country. And, you know, hopefully no politics, uh, no, no personal perspective can screw that up. And so the support we give our athletes, I think, is fundamental. Um, to look at the look at the Paralympic athlete success. Look at Iftahaj in a sport like fencing. This is not just about the NBA. Uh, this is about access for kids in all types of sports with all types of abilities um, to have success and opportunity. Lex is sitting on the stage at the Clinton Global Initiative because of his success as an athlete, and that's because a teacher believed in him and. Then there was a support system at the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee that allowed for him to develop and to grow as an athlete. And now he's a success story and a role model for kids, hopefully all over the country and the world. And so that private support, that you know, the, the one thing that I'm really sensitive to is the business case, uh, and I hear it a lot um, in the Paralympic environment, it shouldn't be about feeling sorry or pity. That's not what, to me, that's not what the Paralympic story is about. The Paralympic story is about hope and opportunity uh, and overcoming obstacles. Uh, and that's why companies should invest. It's why NBC should show more of the games on TV. Uh, it's why when I went to the Paralympics, they were just as exciting from a competitive standpoint, um, awe-inspiring um, to see these athletes compete and achieve uh, at the level they are. I mean, these are not lesser athletes. <laughs> In many ways, they're better athletes because they're overcoming obstacles that some of us can't even imagine. And so the, the business case is clear both at the Olympic and Paralympic uh, movement, which is to create opportunities uh, for our athletes to have great success. And what comes from that hopefully makes this country a better place. Hi, thank you very much. Um, Jason, I've really admired the work you've done since you decided to share your personal story with the world. And I am particularly interested in the fact that the NBA has you working with the young rookies. But something you said um, piqued my attention when you were giving the examples of locker room talk and saying how um, men can find it hurtful when they say you play like a girl. And I think it'd be great if you could change that narrative to say when you play like a girl, that's an extreme compliment. Oh, yeah, it um, definitely is. Well, to give an example, my good friend Tamika Catchings retired on, Friday, on yes. Sunday night. And I was here, and I couldn't go to the game. But my husband took my son and his buddies, my daughter and her boyfriend, and all those boys were so excited to be there. And if you told any of them that they played like her, they would be really excited. And so I think just changing that narrative, play like a girl is amazing. And it's a strong thing and it's a good thing to play like a girl. Definitely, and that's something that, yes. It's definitely something that we talk to the guys about. Um, and in addition to talking to the guys, uh, the NBA also brought in a group of coaches. Um, this is surrounding NBA draft. And these are youth coaches, AAU coaches. And we brought up that issue with them. And a lot of them, again, had no awareness of, you know, when they say that, the impact that it could have. Um, so yeah, it's those coaches, because usually in schools, some of the, the leaders in the schools are the athletes. And who has, who can uh, shape their growing up, their development are their coaches. So we're reach, trying to reach as many people, as many voices as we can to change the culture of sport. And yeah, definitely. Um, I know I don't want to step on a tennis court with Serena Williams. <laughs> right in the middle there. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you for the panel. Very interesting. My question is: um, now it's been at least over a decade or more where we are aware of religion and homosexuality. Why does this phobia still exist in, in 2016 when there's so much awareness about it? 
what are we doing that's not um, what are we not doing that's not reaching out to those uh, people or the population that's not getting it? You know, there are so many organizations that are focused on, on you know, bringing awareness, and yet we're having this conversation today. What else that needs to be done? Well, I mean, Thank you. Sports are a microcosm of our society. So, I mean, we've had talks about race in our country, you know, the, the civil rights movement starting in the 60s. We're still having conversations about civil rights to this very day. So, um, you know, until we address society at large and continue having conversations with people, um, the cool thing about being an athlete is that I can have a positive effect on someone else's life. So, we're trying to get all of these athletes a, a platform to step forward and have a positive impact on someone else's life and talk about these issues in a way for you know, positive change in our society. Yeah, I mean, I, I again, um, you, you think about athletes talking in a locker room and using words to put someone down that are demeaning to someone based on, on who they are. I would imagine in a household in the middle of this country today, parents are using equally derogatory words about people's sexual orientation or their religion or their race today to their kids and perpetuating these unfortunate behavior. And so again, it comes back to what Jason said, this is about education. Um, and we, uh, I think as a country, don't do a very good job of, of you know, if this, if this meeting weren't in New York, you know, if it were in Alabama or, or the middle of this country, I promise you there'd be people out front protesting, all sorts of people here. But you know, we're in New York, I live in Los Angeles, you know, those are two good states to be in. Um, what happens in the middle of the country sometimes is, is different, but look at this Look at this campaign. I mean, I'm sure a lot of, I mean, yes, this is the Clinton Global Initiative, so I think we're all here for a certain reason, but beyond that, I think we all look at the candidate and the things that come out of their mouths and it's reprehensible. But at least half this country doesn't feel that way. And so the problems are big and profound and require, I think, great, great resolve and great action. All right, one, one, more, one more question. Sorry, thanks. Um, Deanna Martin with the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, and I think it um, bears recognizing for the room that although we are asking uh, Casey Wasserman to talk about the business case for athletes speaking up, um, through your uh, philanthropic efforts and your leadership and through the Wasserman Foundation, you provide a platform for them to do that and the infrastructure for them to go to schools. Um, and to participate in videos, and um, Jason, you've done many of them for us. So thank you for doing more than just talking about it, but you've never mon once mentioned the business case when you've supported those efforts. It's always been about the right thing to do, so thank you for that. Um, my question is building on um, playing like a girl. Uh, we did a campaign recently uh, to raise awareness about the fact that uh, when women, when girls get into high school in particular, um, their physical activity drops off by some 89% compared to their male counterparts. Um, and I wondered if you thought there was something more we could do beyond, um, even as a, you know, as a parent uh, of, of a daughter, um, or what this country could do to uh, really change that, to really try to do something more substantive, to encourage girls to be more physically active, um, to stay with it, and then for sure to go on to the Olympics or to professional sports. The one thing that pops into my mind are examples, uh, something that uh, Lex talked about earlier when he had that example of, of or, um, uh, I, my mom butchers names. I inherited uh, that trait. So I'll say Miss Muhammad. <laughs> um, I think you also talked about um, that role model and seeing someone that looks like you. Um, so we need to continue to put images like Miss Muhammad and, and Becca, um, strong women um, who can inspire a generation, um, to continue to give them a platform to tell their stories, to, to share their stories. Because it's something. Um, that Billie Jean King talked about is being a possibility model. And also, in, in, uh, when LGBT, um, especially uh, young men who are gay, go into, they usually drop out because of homophobic, uh, homophobia in sports. So again, I'm a possibility model for them. For, you know, it is possible to you know, play your sport and to be openly gay. Um, so as many possibility models we can put in front of uh, young kids and so that they can see 
oh yeah, I look like that person, I could be that person, um, that pops into my mind. Thank you both so much. Uh, and thank you all for your great questions and uh, your attendance. Um, I think that wraps it up. I mean, people are going to hang out for a few minutes. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll be here for a couple minutes if, if you want to say hello in person or ask a follow-up. And thank you all so much for being here.